Does your company need a boost getting employees to understand that safety is a personal responsibility? Does your company struggle with recordable injuries and lost time accidents? If that's you, give our friends at Wagner Industrial Training Systems a call today at 717-479-1052. Wagner Industrial Training Systems offers a variety of safety and continuous improvement services, including forklift certification and behavioral-based safety training topics that include lockout tagout, machine guarding, PPE, respirable crystalline silica, and countless other topics. Does your company require first aid, CPR, or AED training? Wagner Industrial Training Systems has licensed instructors to cover those topics as well. What would life be like for your family if something happened to you today at work? Give the guys at Wagner Industrial Training Systems a call at 717-479-1052. Also, you can check them out at Facebook at Wagner Industrial Training Systems. All of our Going Yard podcast listeners will get 10% off of their first class just by mentioning that you heard this ad. So call today. Ooh, we're back. We are back. And my, my voice is crazy. We'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. But welcome to episode number five of the Going Yard podcast. We are so glad you guys came back for another round. Can't believe it's number five already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, actually, uh, me and Dan were just sitting here talking before we just we hit the record button for this one. That uh, it's, it, we, ha- we haven't done any uh, actual podcasting for like four or five days. And it's felt like it's been forever in a way because yeah. we've been getting at this every single day for the past month. Yeah. It seems like, yeah, but now we got things kind of down to a science and, um, we got some rookie science, got some rookie science for sure. Got some interviews under our belts and got some really good interviews, uh, potential interviews coming up. Um, actually we do have some good interviews as well, but we, we have some on the horizon that, uh, could be really cool for for the podcast. Could be a lot of fun. I'm I'm excited for what the future has, uh, for what we're hearing from you people out there, um, and the people that are reaching out to us and we're, that we're reaching out to, and the feedback we're getting from them and how excited they are to join us on the podcast. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing too, I, I haven't ever mentioned this on any of the podcasts yet. Maybe I did. I just don't remember. But a big thing for us as a podcast is being seen and known. So we love the fact that you guys are sharing your uh, sharing your posts and, and and things like that, and we love that. The other thing you can do to really help us out is give us a five star rating and review on iTunes. The more five star reviews we get, the easier it's for people to see our podcast. That way, if someone just searches for baseball, they'll be able to see us a, a little bit sooner. They don't have to drag all the way over to find our show. So the more we get, if you guys are listening to us every week. Just do us a big favor. You, you can leave us a review or you can just give us the five stars, that, whatever you want to do. Um, if you don't think we're five stars, that's okay, too. Um, we won't like you, but... <laughs> we'll keep working we're, at it. Though. We're we'll working, working on it. On we're it. working on it because I hate the sound of my own voice. So, you know, I feel sorry for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but especially my voice this week... Um, I just got home. I was in Marco Island for most of the week. Poor guy. Yeah. Hope but he got sunburned. The very first day, eh, not too bad, but the very first day I, I woke up sick, so uh, just laryngitis or something like that. So uh, the entire week I sounded like Fran Drescher or, I don't know, Lois Griffin. And eh, and, uh, <laughs> and so this morning I was literally whispering and talking. It was a mixture of like Scooby-Doo mixed with uh, Fran Drescher this morning. so It's always an interesting combination, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, so... You missed a lot in baseball, I think, Dan, while you were gone. I, mean, I did. You didn't really miss I, anything from the Orioles front, though. Yeah, yeah, but... but yeah, yeah, but I, 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 Tyler reached out to me today, and he's like, all right, well, let's, uh, let's, let's meet up today and do this recording. I'm like, all right, cool. Well, guess what? I haven't watched a single bit of baseball this entire week, so I got to do some, I got to do some studying, but uh, it was back to college days, crash course. Yeah. Without the Adderall. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
but yeah, or the alcohol. <laughs> it, there's enough going on in baseball right now, and uh, enough big stories, and uh, so we'll, we'll get into them today for sure. Also, in this episode, you're going to hear uh, we have an interview. We're really excited to let you guys hear this interview. It's from a gentleman by the name of Carlos Font, who was the interpreter for almost two years for the Minnesota Twins organization, and. You may be thinking, like, why, why, why would they interview an interpreter? Let me tell you, what a story! Great, <laughs> great story. I'll it tell you a, what a what a listen. Honestly, I, I think this guy's got a perspective that most people don't even think about, and yeah, uh, the information he brings to everyone, I think it's going to be great. I I really enjoy getting to talk to him, and I really, really look forward to talking to him again in the future, and maybe mm-hmm. digging a little deeper into some of his experiences with players on a one on one basis. And I mean, obviously, you know, he doesn't need to name names, but just the, the daily interactions. Dropping names sometimes is, is necessary. Yeah, sometimes. But no, I mean, his perspective and, and the things he, he brings up, I think, are pretty cool. And it's a great, great listen. I, and I'm excited for you guys to hear it again. Another another exciting interview. I'm waiting for I'm ready for you guys to hear. That's right. All right. So b- before we get started, we're going to we're going to talk about a, a topic here. I, you see it all over baseball. It, it's every single time you watch a game. Or if you watch a recap, you'll see something pop up on your phone. And let's just say Judge hits a home run. Then all of a sudden you see something. He hits home runs? Yeah. All of a sudden you'll see, you know, check out the stat cast version of Judge. You know, so you learn all this stuff about the home runs. You learn all this stuff about pitching. Things, this geeky science stuff that I never thought I'd ever be interested in, in looking at or caring about. But a lot of it I do get pretty interested about and when i do my research for some of these episodes i dig in deep and you know there's different buttons when you go to the the websites and you can find out you know, how does he how 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 much spin vol- rotation is on his curveball and how how fast does it go from you know top to bottom kind of thing you know when it drops out and i think it's pretty interesting and i think it's changing the game uh, the one thing I, I brought up to Tyler, uh, him and I think him and I were talking about it before, but the, the, you'll see that the roster, the lineup, the batting lineup has actually changed. Where you still have a big guy at cleanup, but it's not the guy you would think be at cleanup. He's batting second. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's very interesting um, because you're starting to see <clears throat> where you used to always just be an on-base percentage guy, or the fastest guy on the team had to bat leadoff. Well, it's starting to change a little bit in that world. Uh, and actually, there's more and more guys, one through nine, that can hit for power and drive the ball out of the stadium. So I think that's part of the change. Mm-hmm. But there's definitely a, a change in, in how coaches perceive it. And there's a lot of information for coaches to digest, honestly. Um, you know, you talk about the stat cast thing, and I was just reading a thing the other day about how far stolen bases have went down even in college baseball from the 70s and 80s and how that's changing and how people don't want to risk the out for the reward of just getting into scoring position. So there's so many things out there to talk about. And it's interesting to me. Uh, I, I think a lot of it is definitely for the casual fan to get their attention because when you see some of the numbers, you're like, whoa, that guy hit a ball 480 feet. And yeah. at 119 miles an hour off, the, I mean, I, I'm just throwing a number out there off the bat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Kyle Schwarber has, you know, an average like exit velocity of 96 miles an hour. Like these are real legitimate numbers and things that people, you know, we we never knew about this 10 years ago. I mean, well, you know, there was probably guys that, that took a measurement with a radar gun off their bat, but now it's becoming very pronounced in the game and publicized in a way for anybody to find. Right. Well, yeah, I... I I thought it was really cool. I, I I like it a lot. I learned some stupid <laughs> facts that I would never impress anybody with, but I think it's it's changing the game in the way that people coach it. Uh, the the managers are coaching the way they're putting their lineups. I thought that was a really big thing because I, I didn't even notice it until someone called it because I thought like why is he why is Machado batting second like what is going on here or, or yeah well, I mean like Adam Jones was batting leadoff for those yeah for a while. now Trey Mancini is um, yeah it, I'll tell you one of the most interesting things that I, I find in all these stat cast numbers is when they show the highlight of the outfielder making this amazing catch and they show his the the distance he traveled how many feet he ran right how fast he ran his top speed uh, to the ball, his, 
um, percentage of accuracy, basically the best route available. Did he take the best route to the ball? Isn't that wild? It's pretty, it's, it's ridiculous, honestly, how uh, specific these numbers get to. I mean, and then it gets exaggerated to where like Rich Hill and the spin rate of a curveball. It's like, whoa, what, m- most people don't even understand what that means. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's going to happen if it's a higher number or a lower number? I, I just saw a new one today called Z, the, the Z swing. And it's where they measure how many swings you take inside the strike zone uh, and basically your batting average on, I think it's batting average, on balls that you hit, which are in the Z swing area. And I was like, I don't even know what this means. I'm trying to digest it and figure it out. I I need to go back through and really reread it and reanalyze it because it's so new. I'm like, I mean, I've heard of your batting average on balls put in play. That's another new one. I mean, it's. There's a lot of newer ones that are coming along, and they're just accelerated. It seems like every six months or three months, we're getting something, some new stat that is thrown out there. Yeah, I, I always, I also think it's funny because it makes the the players look even more amazing than they actually are. Because like, yeah, I knew if I, I knew I had to jump at this this exact time in order to yeah. uh, catch that ball. They, they make was, it look too easy, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that's the problem yeah. in a way is that. People think playing the game, it's like watching a tennis player or, or Tiger Woods in his prime. Hey, golf is nowhere near that easy. I'm sorry for anybody, yeah. anybody who plays every day. It's not that playing baseball, the way they make it look is not that easy. It's really not to backhand a ball Super in human. the hole, turn and throw it <clears throat> is just ridiculous. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's one of those things that, that, as these stats continue to grow and people start to understand them a little bit more, it's gonna. It used to just be your batting average, your earned run average, how many home runs, how many RBIs, <clears throat> how many strikeouts you had as a pitcher. I mean, they're real basic numbers, but now it's all of these things. You got OPS and you know first pitch strikes. So those have all been big things that coaches care about, but most fans don't really understand or care about it. But all of these statistics now are becoming very mainstream, and for the casual fan, I hope they can keep up with it. For the diehard, I hope they don't <laughs> turn their back to it because I, I think some of these things, it, it's like launch angle we talked about. It has a place in the game. I just wonder how much of it, you know, when you start only focusing on one side of it, mm-hmm. how much of the other sides of it are you going to lose? Because it's like it, like the strikeout rate has went so high that the on-base percentage doesn't even seem to come into play anymore. And it's a shame because there's not as many guys on game on base, so there's not as many guys in scoring position. So it's really just not as exciting in, in, in times. Don't get me wrong, the pitchers are ridiculous sometimes too, but it's just one of these things that when you only focus on one thing, you start to lose all of the fundamental stuff on the other side of it. Yeah, and just like anything, you overanalyze anything. It doesn't matter if it's sports or if it's your job, whatever. You go overanalyze things, you, you tend to get into some trouble. So I, I can kind of see your your point on that for sure. So you guys listening at home, if uh, give us give us your thoughts on, on what you think about the stat cast. Is it is it changing the game for the better? Is it do you, do you could, could you care less? Um, you know, just it's give always us, interesting. Give us your like when you watch like Billy Hamilton steal a base and they show you how fast he goes from you know first to third or any of those things. Like I said, the, <clears> they're they're impressive numbers to see, and you're like, damn. I mean, like, is it really that easy? It's really not, but right. they really make it look that easy and. It's pretty exciting in a way to to have it broken down and all that, but it's one of those that it's not going away, so we got to get used to it, I think. Yep. It's like sports science on ESPN. Uh, it was a big hit for a long while. That's why, you know, it seems like they're ever-changing these from, from year to year with baseball. Yep. Yeah, so let us know, guys. Let us know what you think about uh, that stat cast. All right, this brings us to the three up, three down segment of the show. Those of you who are just joining us said, aren't familiar with this we take three teams or three players um we talk about the ones that are trending up and the ones that are trending down so there are a few going in each direction my yeah friend. and there a lot of them are going directions that we did not expect when we first started this that's for sure um uh, yeah but we're going to talk about a guy we've talked about every single episode i'm sure people are probably getting tired of hearing about him on everything baseball but when you have someone that's this amazing you you really you have to talk about it. so we're talking about Shohei Otani right now at pitching he's two and one with a 4.43 ERA at bat he's batting 333 with three home runs 11 RBIs the other day he was batting cleanup for pool holes 
<laughs> he was out. Um, and, and a couple other things. He he threw eight pitches in the game the other day that were over 100 miles per hour, and I think four of them were over 101. And I believe – didn't he, he set the record for the fastest pitch thrown? Is that I, – I don't know. I didn't see that part. Maybe. I, I could I be wrong. Know. I could be I wrong. Know. Call me out on it. But uh, another cool thing I heard, he's the only player to ever throw and hit a 100-mile pitch. Wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, this says – I think it was just for this year, but I mean, I'd like to find out the stats, see if that's how long that goes back. But, and he has struck out this year, the reigning MVP El Tuve and homered off of the reigning Cy Young winner, Corey Kluber. (laughs) That's crazy to even think. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think? (laughs) I am, like I said, this guy is doing everything that was advertised that he could do. In Japan right now. Real deal. What did you say his ERA was again, Dan? Uh, ERA is 443. So it's not great. That's yeah. not great. But I'll tell you, he's had spurts where you can see the potential in this guy. Mm-hmm. He he has a bunch of strikeouts as a power pitcher, kind of. And then he's this finesse guy. His hitting is really coming along. I thought that he was actually going to be a better pitcher than he is hitter, and I think it might be the other way. And maybe it's just because he doesn't have as many at-bats as a full-time player. Right. Um, But the big leagues will adjust. They always do. But I think this guy's going to adjust with them. Um, Like you said, we, we have kind of brought him up every podcast, but he is doing things that this game has not seen ever before. Yeah. So, And he's only 23. Three? Yeah, he's a young. He's kind of young. He's not one of these thirty-year-old guys that's pitched ten thousand innings in yeah. the the, uh, the Asian leagues. You know, whether it's in Japan or Taiwan. You know, he, he's a he's a young guy still. So th- this guy has a huge ceiling, and it's exciting. Uh, I, like I said, Mike Trout needed the help. He's getting the help a little bit from this guy. What a year Mike Trout's having! Yeah. He's hit ten home runs or something already as of today. So. Um, I'm excited for what this Otani guy that I know you, you love him. You brought him up from the beginning in yeah. a way, but if he continues on this tear, it's going to be hard to have him not hit more. It's going to be hard to have him just throw, you know, he might have to get into the regular rotation of every five days and get after it for that team, for them to really compete down the stretch. And, you know, at the beginning of the year, it's 162 games. So if they stretch him out and you wait till about the all-star break, then you really start pushing and making a run with him. That's probably a smart decision as opposed to jumping right into it right now and trying to burn the wheels off of it. So, but it'll be interesting to see how his body holds up throughout the course of the year. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I wanted you, your opinion on this. You you have talked about and you brought up how it's, it's obviously changing the game and and this will change the way that managers will manage their team. When do you think we'll start seeing more pitchers take the DH role. Do you think this year MLB is just kind of waiting it out, see how see how this works out with him to see if it's even you – know, is this just a fluke or is this even manageable? Or do you think this is something that currently right now they're starting to kind of pull guys out in, in the farms, farm leagues and say, hey. I definitely think that it's going to take a little bit. Okay. But I think – as you enter this next MLB draft, this next uh, international signing pool period, you'll start to see more of these guys. I think pushing that—that's where you're going to see it more—is in the agents, in the in the younger levels, in the younger where these up. guys are going to push for mm-hmm. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's where they're going to say, "Well, I'm not going to take your offer out of high school unless you're going to let me hit and pitch." So, because that's what happens to a lot of these guys is they get they have a Division One scholarship. Mm-hmm. They get drafted probably higher than they should because that's what teams kind of do. They overreach to entice these guys not to go to college so they can overpay them. But then they take the bat out of their hands. So if the, if this if he can be successful doing it, then I surely think that in the next two, three, four years, it's probably going to take three, four, five years to get another guy like him through the minors and in. Mm-hmm. But – I definitely think it's – I mean, you've had a lot of guys that get drafted as position players and then they end up as pitchers because they just didn't – they couldn't hit. But they all had plus arms and played shortstop or they were a catcher and they could throw – you know, like Jansen for uh, the Dodgers came up as a catcher, I believe. He has a cannon for an arm. So it's just – I think it's going to take a little bit of time, but I definitely think if he's successful doing it, then you're going to see more guys coming out of college, more guys coming out of high school, and these agents saying that my guy wants to hit and pitch. 
I agree. So what do you think, just a quick prediction, you don't, you don't have to, uh, well, I might hold you to it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think for his year as a pitcher, how many wins do you think he's going to get? I think he's probably going to fall in maybe that 12 to 15 category. If I had to pick a number, I would probably put it at 14. If okay. I had to go over or under, I would say 14. And as for one offense, um, you think he's going to be a 300 hitter the no. entire year? No, I think he's probably going to end up settling around mm-hmm. maybe 265 to 275. I think that's probably – he might push 280. But I, I find that that's probably where he's going to be. I mean, if he hits over 300, good lordy B. I mean uh, – <laughs> Good elite, lordy B. That's a, sorry, guys, a little <laughs> weird. But, I mean, elite hitters in the game hit for 300. Right. So – for him to hit that high would be impressive. I mean, hitting 260 to 275 is a solid hitter in the major leagues. I mean, I didn't realize he had that much velocity on it. I didn't realize he could hit over 100 like that. I thought that he was a 95 to 98 guy. I didn't realize he had that 101 in him. Um, and just think the longevity of him, he might move into a bullpen roll down the road or something if he had. I mean, he like you said, he's young, so... The sky is the limit for mm-hmm. this guy in a way. So it's very ex- interesting. It's definitely interesting for us, I think, to bring up every single week on here because it's always something new. I mean, last week it was a triple. This week he's hitting 100 and some miles an hour on the radar gun. What's it going to be next week? He hits yeah. a, inside the Parker uh, while he's pitching. I mean, well, I, I can't wait for the chance when he pitches in the National League and he hits for himself how that works out in a real game because mm-hmm. I don't think that's happened yet. Yep. All right. Well, let's talk about the Diamondbacks. Um, Ooh, they have boy. yet to lose a series. Um, they're seventeen and seven, and I mean their pitching is amazing with Patrick Corbin. Four, he's four zero, one point eight nine ERA, forty eight strikeouts. Uh, he's dominant versus left handers le- against left handers zero point zero zero ERA, uh, and then pitching at home. He has a 1.29 ERA versus away, which is 5.06. Um, godly also, he's Godly off, uh, awesome. Um, <laughs> I tried making some fun pun with that, but it didn't work out. Uh, but three and one, 3.09 ERA, 24 strikeouts. Uh, where are these guys coming from, man? Like I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even think. I, I, I feel like I always forget about this team. <laughs> it kind of goes back to what we said last week about playing on the West Coast and all that, but this team's good. I underestimate it how well they would do. I mean, I know it's early, but the mm. whole segment is three up, and this team is on the way up. And yeah. if this team keeps going down the road they're going on, I think that it could get very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the Dodgers are obviously the Dodgers, and I don't believe no matter how they struggle, they're going to be there towards the end of it, but... This team is overachieving, and if these guys continue to build that confidence, who knows who they trade for? Does Do they trade for a Machado? Do they trade for a healthy Josh Donaldson mm-hmm. uh, to infuse that bat into the lineup with the defense? Or do they trade for another pitcher to try and lock things down? I mean, all those people you brought up, Zach Greinke is like, just doing okay compared to some of those other guys, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy to me. You know what I mean? And he's a stud, you know, a Cy Young candidate a lot. So this team could really, really make things interesting. If they stay healthy, that'll, that'll help their calls, obviously, because I don't know how much depth they truly have. That's yeah. one thing that worries me is the depth. So we'll see, but they're definitely trending up. What do you, what do you think about well, this? This was a shocker. I, I actually I was, I was watching some, some uh, clips from some of their racing games. I am... I got a boner for Paul Goldschmidt. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> He's yes. a beast, man. Mon- Speaking of stat cast, watch, watch his uh, most recent home run. It, it, was, it was a bomb. That kills um, it, man, Gerard, all the time. Gerard Dyson, same thing. He's, he's also doing well hitting, uh, but the outfield, man, he – He's an amazing he's fast. Outfielder. He's very fast, very very fast. Yep. And uh, David Peralta, he's killing it. So uh, Peralta's I, a solid baseball player. I yeah, mean, he's been around a while. He knows what he's doing. It's not a surprise. But I, I think if the pitching continues at this rate, they're going to knock off some wins and surprise people with how many they accumulate. I, I'm actually I, I'm really becoming a fan of them. And I know their you gray said uniforms the Dodgers, are weird, man. The I know gray, that is strange. I, I, that is strange. Actually, it's not even gray. It's like graphite. It's a whole totally different <laughs> color than you know the road grays yeah. or anything that people wear. So yeah, I, I 
I do find it interesting though. I think when you, I know you said that the Dodgers are the Dodgers, and you don't think they're going to go that far. But man, I really hope you're wrong because this is this is kind of cool to watch. And this team has been around now for 20 years. It's crazy. I Isn't remember when nuts? this happened. You know what I mean? I remember when, that, when, when the like, Marlins the, came it, in together. The, the Expos left. Yeah, well, yeah, no, that was that, that was later. That was, that was later, later. But no, like, the Marlins and the Diamondbacks, I believe, came in together. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been that long. I mean. I, I was in Phoenix a couple years ago and drove downtown, and it was kind of interesting. Cause you got like the basketball stadium, and the baseball stadium, all like right there yeah. near each other. And I thought, man, like that stadium doesn't even look big. I kind of, if if when we went on the trip, I was praying that they played at home so I could go to a game and check it out. But they weren't; they were on the road, so it kind of sucked. But I, I can't believe it's been that long since they've been a franchise. And you know, it, it's exciting for for that city and that town. And they're, they're, they love their sports out there in Arizona. So hopefully, they can give those fans something to keep cheering about as the, the dog days of summer go on. All right. Well, the last one we're going to talk about that uh, for trending up, we're going to talk about the Mets, the Amazons, 15 and eight. Um, the pitching is absolutely incredible. I, I will say that, um, where was I going with this? Uh, I'll, it'll come back to me, but the pitching's great. Um, it, it, on offense, I mean, their top guys, uh, they're hit doubles and dingers. Like if you look Double, at the stats, triples and dingers, but, man. But it's it's incredible. Like the top guys uh, with Cabrera, Cespedes, Jay Bruce, Todd Frazier, all those guys. Uh, that's that's all they're doing. Jay Bruce was a very quiet signing uh, in the middle of the all season for that team. Uh, he's always been a productive guy. He's been very consistent throughout his career. So for him to come in and kind of stabilize that offense a little bit and give them what they – that's exactly what they needed mm-hmm. uh, to help this team out. The pitching is what's going to – this. the pitching is what's going to make them an elite team. And if that starting rotation stays healthy and if they pitch to their potential, there's not another team in National League that can compete with them one through five. There's not. I, the Dodgers can't do it. The Cubs can't do it. The Nats certain can't do it. So you can go through the list of teams. Mm. One through five starting rotation guys, they have the best names, the best potential. It's a matter of staying healthy, staying consistent. And if the offense can continue to give that team three, four, five runs a night, those pitchers are going to rack up some wins because they all have the ability to keep a team to two or three runs a night. So like I said, I, I think they might need a bullpen piece. Maybe maybe another that, offensive bat. That's where I was. That's where I was going with it. Yeah, because you got the you got these. Their three top pitchers. I mean, they're they're pitching lights out. All right. Um, I, I like I talked a little bit about Syndergaard last week. We we, we did with Dave, and that guy's awesome. I, I love watching him play. Degrom, same deal. Yeah. Um, all the hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but my thought is, do they have like? What do you think of their bullpen? Do you think it's it, that could be a, a downside going forward if – if I don't, or how do, you, how do you feel about it? I, I don't know if it's going to be a downside, but I definitely think it's going to be a spot where they're going to need to improve. I mean, okay. like I said before, the game's about bullpens, and that's what you're going to need. And it's one of those that in September you can call up guys out of the minor leagues and you can find a couple of your prospects that can hit 100 miles an hour or more. But, you know, if you're in a playoff hunt, you want established guys that you can count on day in, day out, not be a surprise. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's some trade pieces probably out there to be had. Do they have the farm system? Do they want to get rid of some of the farm pieces they have to go get them? I don't know. They've never been a team to spend a ton of money, so I doubt they're going to take on a big salary for a player. But the team has the talent on it now to compete, and I think they're going to be in the thick of it for a long, long time. Like I said, it's all about – Baseball is about starting pitching, and no matter how, how important the bullpen is, if your starter can go six, seven innings, eight innings, then you're going to be successful most times. So this team has that rotation, one through five, all the guys that you can list and go through a name. And and they got the guys to put the runs on the board. Too. They, they do. So. They have enough offense. Like I said, I think they're probably they're going to need to trade at some point for another bullpen guy, and they're probably going to want to trade for another bat. And, and I'm not saying they need to go out and get, like, a Machado or something. I'm not going down that road. I mean, obviously they have Todd Frazier, but, I mean, I think they're going to need to find somebody that has some pop in their bat. And, you know, there's guys out there like a Mark Reynolds that floats around and always finds himself on a team or, um, you know, who – and there's a few guys that are like that, but hmm. who have pop in the bat that can, you know, hit a two, three-run homer off the bench when you need to hit for a pitcher, especially in the National League. So they're an interesting team. I'm, I'm excited for them. 
I think the Phillies are overachieving a little bit in that division. I think they're doing a lot of the things right. The Nats are going to be on their heels, I think, at some point. They're struggling now, but the Mets are, are I think, trending up, and they're going to keep continuing to trend up, Dan. All right. Well, we will see. Let's move down to uh, the people that aren't doing as well. All right. So we're going to talk about the, <laughs> the Twins. Three down. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the Twins, and we, we were just recently talking about how impressed we were with the Twins, and it's amazing. Th- this is why I think baseball is exciting for me, and a lot of people, are, they don't like hearing about why you guys even watch baseball this early in, in the year. It makes no sense. But these are the things that you, you see it change from week to week, and it's just amazing how it happens. So the Twins, one of those teams, 8-12, eight and, eight and 12, they dropped down the third in the uh, Central. They lost their last seven. Um, so the pitching by, uh, Barrios, he's right now, he's two and two with, uh, 36 strikeouts. Uh, oh, excuse me. Hold on. I'm malfunctioning here. Um, Gibson has had some solid starts and, uh, same with Oda Rizzi. But my question for you is, uh, what do you think of their bullpen? I know I asked you about the last one. Uh, is that what's making this all go to hell you think or what? You know, every team has their struggles, and this is one of those teams that's having their struggle right now. Um, I was a, This is a team I'm very high on overall. I still think that they're going to right the ship because I think they have the right pieces in place. I mean, they did just get back from Puerto Rico, so as high as that was for some of their players, I definitely think that that's an adjustment that – you know, the traveling to and from could be a hangover in a way of the jet lag. You know, it's, it's kind of like the East Coast going to the West Coast. They, they're in the Central, and they go all the way out to Puerto Rico, and they come all the way back. They did just play the Yankees. The Yankees, um, they're no slouch, I guess. I mean, the Twins are good. So for them to get beat by the Yankees like they did, maybe that says more about the Yankees than how bad the Twins are. But the Twins are definitely struggling, and... It's one of those things that the Indians have started to turn the corner a little bit and they've put some wins on the board. It's going to be interesting to see. This team hasn't proved anything, though, in the past. So they have veteran players like a Joe Maurer and Dozier that have been around a while, but they haven't really proved anything. So like the Twins, you know, they've been to the world. I mean, the, the, the Indians, they've been to the World Series. They've been to the playoffs. They've proved how to bounce back from a losing streak, and it's early. I get it. But you don't want to have two, three of these types of events happen in the course of your season. And, you know, the Barrios guy, he's the kind of guy that he needs to stop the bleeding when you hit one of these. He can't mm-hmm. contribute to it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, if the Dodgers go out and lose three in a row and Kershaw takes the mound, everybody expects him to write the ship. You know what I mean? Right. So, and then for Barrios, he's the guy that he needs to write the ship. So he can't have the letdown in the middle of one of these. So let's hope that this is just a hiccup for Twins fans. Let's just hope. If you're an Indians fan, you're like, hell yeah, keep it going. <laughs> so, But I definitely think that it's early. I think they'll get going in the right direction again. But you never know. This could be a sign of, of a problem later down the road. All right. Well, for those of you listening or watching right now on uh, YouTube Live, um, if you saw or heard me have a little hiccup there. <laughs> Dan had to make an exit real quick. Yeah. So my my like I said, I just got back from Marco Island, and my dog just came home. And realized that I was upstairs and hadn't seen me in almost a week. So he just busted through the door while we're in the <laughs> middle of doing this. So, um, hey, stuff happens. <laughs> Take it on our toes. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about, I know we talk about the Orioles a lot. And it, it, it's usually just kind of in passing. We haven't actually talked about the Orioles. Um, and, and I'm not really excited to talk about the Orioles because six at 6 and 19. Oh. Is this, this is the worst start since, what, 88? 88, yeah. Um, Ugh. I mean, the pitching is horrendous. Uh, I mean, I, I was really excited for, for Bundy. Um, he's, I, th- I think he's probably the one I, I think is going to be doing the best for the team. Tillman's doing horrible this year. His ERA is almost 10. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, what, what do you think, what's your hope for pitching this year? Like, is it, what, what do you, you think needs to happen? What needs to happen is we need to find some consistency. Guys do not have fastball command, and Bundy's done a good job. He just got roughed up by the the Rays yesterday. Other than that, he's looked good. He hasn't had any run support. I think Alex Cobb 
was definitely an overpay. I guess this is the Ubaldo replacement. Like, hell, we paid this guy $12.5 million. We might as well find another one that we could pay $12.5 million. Yeah. I do think Alex Cobb is a proven AL East player, which is big. But he – signing him that late seems to have screwed him over. And, you know, Trumbo's hurt. Not that he had a great year last year, but he can hit for power. Not that the weather's been really up for that. So that hurts. You have an all-star closer, Zach Britton, who's hurt. God only knows when he'll get back. He has been throwing off a half mound. He threw on a full mound. He's been fielding balls. He He's won – wet day from being back, you know, three, three, four weeks behind. So yeah, this team is going to have to start. Oh, you have scope. Who's on the DL too, an all-star yeah. second baseman who yep. basically led the team when Manny was down last year. Offensively, this team is in trouble though. Big trouble. You have teams like the Red Sox that are off to one of their best starts in, in their history. You have the Yankees that have a ton of talent. You have the blue Jays who are way ahead. The, the Rays just kicked our ass. So it's one of those that there's not much to um, to, to be excited about right now. Yeah. And with the injuries, it, this team, if they're going to overhaul things, are going to need to get these guys healthy so that they can trade them and unload them and actually start the rebuild. You know, it's yeah, and, and, and to, they're like Detroit, dude. They waited too long to do the rebuild. They thought that they could just re, re you know reload. And unfortunately for them, I think their window, like the Royals, has passed. Mm-hmm. And you try to hang on, and you try to hang on, you try to hang on to these guys That's that people what bought I was, jerseys for. I was thinking the same exact thing because the the past five six years have been so exciting to watch, and yes. they just got better and better every single year. They made it to one more game, you know. It seemed like, um, and it, we we knew that hey, this is going to be another playoff year. And, it, and this year, like Machado is the only thing that's really happening right now. I mean, Jones is doing well too, but Machado, he's, he's leading the team in every single stat except strikeouts. Uh, Surprisingly, <laughs> I guess, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, and speaking of strikeouts, I mean, Davis, he's on track to Goodness, have 160 man. plus strikeouts. If he c- keeps up with this, it's crazy so. to me. Like, honestly, it's, I, I watch it. I, I mean, I just went to the game last Saturday and the Indians, uh, Clevenger, it, it was a very boring game as a fan to watch. Um, he shut the Orioles down, and it wasn't even close. The Indians won four to nothing. It was played in like two hours and thirty five or forty minutes. It as a fan, it was very boring. It wasn't much action on the Orioles side of it to get the fans involved. There was a lot of Cleveland fans there, so you know I've been at Orioles Stadium when they were bad, and the, and the stadium was chanting "Let's go Mets," which. <laughs> was a National League team, which was even crazier. Yeah, I mean, we've always had the Yankee fans and the I, Boston I, fans. Come, I think but... I may have been at that same exact game because we were like, what, uh, 21 games behind? Oh, we were awful, man. Like so it, it's just this is not setting itself up. And, I mean, I see on the news or whatever I read that, you know, the players are disappointed there's not enough fans. When you play that badly, what is there to go out and cheer for? Yeah. Honestly, it, I love the Orioles. I'm a die hard Orioles fan. I don't have a tattoo on my body. If I was going to get one, it might be the Oriole logo. <laughs> That's yeah. how much I love my Orioles. But this is terrible to see and watch. I agree. I have my little reminders that pop up on my phone all the time about the games about to start. And I'm like, okay, where, where's Otani playing? <laughs> yeah, I, I get those reminders, it's and the next so reminder sad. says Orioles hit a home run, but still trail six to four. Yeah. Oh, great! Yeah, typical. So, so, well, listen, we're gonna go right down the 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 Beltway here to uh, the Nationals. Okay, right now they're eleven and fourteen, below five hundred. Um, this weekend they're going in a series against the Diamondbacks. <laughs> could so, be interesting. yeah, it could be interesting. And I mean, we've talked about. Scherzer, Strasbourg, Ball, Gio Gonzalez, uh, the hitting with Harper, Eaton, and now we're seeing some life out of Trey Turner, Andrew Stevenson. Um, they're just falling apart at the end. Uh, this team has too much talent to be where they are right now. Yeah, I don't know if it's just a product of the early season. Pitcher's not fully ready to go. Bryce Harper's been ready to go. There's no doubt about that. Adam Eaton got nicked up for a little bit. Um, you know, so... This team has too much talent to not be first, second place at the end of the year. But what are, I don't really know where the help's going to come from. Um, Daniel Murphy needs to get get it right. Uh, you know, so there's some guys there. 
Adam Eaton needs to get it right. He needs to help, too. I mean, they gave up a lot for that guy. Their pitching is going to be there, I think, consistently from here going forward as the weather gets better, as games get more consistent, you don't get snow and rain and cancellations and all that. I think that, that has an effect on the pitchers a lot. Uh, you know, the guy, the pitcher, the, the batters can go take swings in the cage and turn the machine on and do some of those things. You know, pitchers are cre- – baseball players are a creature of habit. Pitchers are probably the biggest creature of habit. And, you know, this weather and, and all that stuff I think plays a bigger toll on them in the long run. So I, I think this team will eventually get it going in the right direction, obviously. But just a matter of when, like you keep, I keep looking at it. When, 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 when's it going to be? Like, who are they going to? Are they going to play the Marlins to get it going? Like, what's it going to take to get these guys jump started and going in the right direction? Yeah, I agree with you as well. They, like you said, the, the team is too good, and it's just I feel like it's just a hiccup, and they just got to find their stride again. And it could be really a series like this weekend where you, in your head, you're like, all right, well, they're they're below five hundred, and things are kind of going sour for them. This could be this could put them out like in their psyche you know yeah or it could boost them up so it's uh, one of those you definitely have to take the good with the bad and mm -hmm. hope that the bad doesn't last too long you know what i mean this is you don't like i said with the uh, twins you don't you hope that this isn't something that's going to hit them in august when the playoff like you know you don't want to revert back to what you were and and hope that you're that lad that ladder is continuing to go up you know Mm -hmm. what i mean so that's the only thing that worries me a little bit is how are they going to get it turned around, and is this something that's going to hit them again? I mean, obviously every team's going to have their two, three, four game losing streak. It's do I have four or five game losing streaks or ten? Like, does it does a three game losing streak turn into an eight game losing streak? You know, like that, that, and that's what you don't want to have happen. And you keep doing this, playing this middle of the road ball. You come in and you play a team like the Mets in your own division. Well, winning one game, there's like winning two because you know you're going to leapfrog and go and go. So. It, it, they better hope they get it right before they really start diving into playing the Mets. And, you know, even the Braves might sneak some wins in and the Phillies might sneak some wins in that, that we didn't see coming just because these teams are getting better. Speaking of Braves, we won't go too far into it because I know we're about to wrap up this segment. Yeah, but did, man. Did you see uh, Ronald uh, Acuna? Acuna's uh, did. The future, the future of his <laughs> here, him and Albe is the, the yeah. two youngest guys ever. Uh, this is what, the very first episode of this podcast. I talked about how excited I was for the Atlanta Braves' future. And this guy... I get why they kind of waited uh, a little bit because of the whole – they can say what they want. The guy proved everything he needed to prove in the AAA or in the minors completely and in spring training. Uh, he did get off to a little slow start, but this guy has superstar potential. The team has a lot of young talent. This guy, you're going to hear his name a lot over the next several months, I believe. He, he I think he has as much, if not more, talent than Chris Bryant when he came up Ooh. or uh, even Machado when he hit the franchise. This guy has that much talent. He's like 19 yeah. years old in a few days or so. So him and Albae is together uh, in that order. Yeah, Swanson, uh, even uh, Flair Dog Flaherty from the from the Orioles was doing well for them. So I, I'm excited for that young team. He he's a he's a bright spot. I mean I can't wait to see some. I mean his first home run he hit however far, but it was a bomb up into the second deck. Yep, it was a big one. All right, so hey, if you guys have your opinions on what you think, uh, if, if you thought we were wrong about. What was trending up and trending down, which I don't think you Or you can. don't like how we talk about your team. And we don't like, yeah, come on. Let us know what you think we should talk about for the next three up, three down segment. Which teams, which players, who do you want us to dig deep into? And we would be happy to do that. So um, that wraps up the three up, three down segment. And uh, this is actually going to go into our interview. Um, we interviewed, like I said, at the beginning of the segment, he was actually this Spanish interpreter for the Minnesota Twins. His name's Carlos Font, so I hope you guys enjoyed it's that It's a good one. Listen interview. up. Yep. All right. We are on the line with Carlos Font. Carlos is a graduate of Southern Nazarene University in Oklahoma. And while in college, Carlos was a media relations intern for the Oklahoma City Dodgers baseball team and also a communications intern for the Oklahoma City Thunder. He would later land a job with the Minnesota Twins, where he served for nearly two years as the translator for the media for all Twins Spanish-speaking players, both pregame and postgame. He'd also provide counsel to Twins Latino players related to the media and public relations opportunities. Outside of baseball, I also learned that he's a voice talent for Spanish-speaking radio commercials. So, Carlos... Welcome to the show. We appreciate you coming on to the Going Yard podcast. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. I'm actually really excited because I feel like I could learn a thing or two from you because you have enough uh, radio and TV experience, and we're just starting <laughs> out in this uh, this podcast radio type of world. So it's it should be pretty pretty exciting. Well, I'll tell you this. I took a uh, student recording class in college, and let's say I remember about ten percent of the class because the class was so boring and the professor sucked so much that I fell asleep by every single class. So don't don't take too many advice from me. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Carlos? This is Tyler. Doing good. Doing good. Ah, oh, man, I'll tell you. I was. I bet you probably didn't realize you did all those things, did you? Until Dan read them off. <laughs> No, no, that, that sounds like an impressive resume right there. <laughs> so, so your your Spanish speaking radio commercials? Did you do any singing, like a jingle or anything like that? Anything, no, not fun? really. It was, no, not really. No, it was it was for the twins. Um, they had their, or you know, through the radio broadcast, they also have a Spanish broadcast with Twins Legend, and I don't know how this guy's not in the whole thing. Tony Oliva and his, you know, his play by play partner. They had a. They did, um, they called the game in Spanish from time to time. They had, I think they had like about 20 or 25 games of the broadcast. So, um, they showed through the, uh, Spanish radio station. They threw jingles in, not jingles, but commercials for, uh, the fans to come to the Twins games and they needed someone to do it in Spanish. So they kind of threw me under the fire and I did it, but no, nothing, nothing too drastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's awesome though. I mean, with your resume, I think uh, I think anyone could hire you, especially these days. I mean, with with baseball alone, I think uh, the Latino players. I think it's what thirty percent right now in um, yep, Major League 30%. Baseball, and it could only get more um, going forward. So, um, I, I think someone like that would be very very beneficial in baseball and in any sport, really. But um, but you're seeing it more in baseball now. <clears throat> right? Yeah, you see when. I... When I first started out, or not started out, when I was when I went to college, I wanted to be a broadcaster, and obviously baseball is my thing. It's what I, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico, it's, it's in our blood. So I definitely, I wanted to work in baseball. I knew I wasn't gonna make, I wasn't gonna get drafted. I wasn't gonna get signed at a, you know, at a college. I was shocked that I got a college, a college scholarship. But uh, so yeah, it's one of those things where like I thought it worked well. I spoke Spanish, so it was it's almost like a. Uh, a boost. I mean, I think it's more impressive for somebody that wants to work in baseball that has Spanish-speaking skills on their resume. Yeah. It, I think that seems more enticing for an employer than someone who doesn't speak Spanish, especially if that position has a lot of interactions with the players. Right. Well, let's... Um Let's let's not go too far past your your college experience um, or or your baseball career. We like to ask anybody has has to do with uh, the baseball business. Um, we, we'd like to know like how long did you play and um, you know what position did you play. Tell us a little bit about where you're coming from um, and your and your baseball playing days. Right. So like I said, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, I was born in San Puerto Rico. Um, Let's see. Uh, from the beginning, I uh, I wanted to play baseball, just like every really young kid in Puerto Rico, and I did so. It, uh, I played a bunch of different leagues as a kid, and eventually I moved over. We moved over to San Juan, the capital, mm-hmm. which is where I was born, and uh, I got the privilege to train and practice at the Roberto Clemente. Um, gosh, what is the name of that complex? The um, Roberto Clemente put up a complex before he died. That, that was his dream. Um, one of the Port City or Sports City is what the name of the complex is, and I got the privilege to train there. Um, and that was really, to be honest with you, I played there from the time I was four to about seven years old, and then I quit. I didn't want to play baseball anymore. Um, I have an uncle uh, from my dad's side of the family who played basketball, and he was a pretty good college basketball player in Puerto Rico. So I told my dad I wanted to stop playing baseball and I wanted to play basketball, and I did that from seven years old. Until 14, I mean, I, I also played basketball throughout my high school career, but when I was 14, I got to Oklahoma and or uh, my high school, one of my, I had about three different high school baseball coaches, but the first one I had, uh, he was a big baseball fan and he told me, well, you're Puerto Rican, so you're playing baseball, I don't care what you say. <laughs> uh, so sure enough, I, uh, they threw me on the fire. Uh, I hadn't played baseball in almost seven, eight years and. You know, I was kind of shocked at myself how, how naturally it came back to me, even though I, I hadn't played so long. Obviously, I played catching my dad and went to baseball games. 
but you know, um, it just kind of came back to me. And obviously, I was lucky enough to win a scholarship uh, at Southern National University, and uh, I played there for two and a half years. Uh, midway right right before we broke out for Christmas break, I had a talk with my coach about where I was mentally and how I didn't think, you know, like I said before, I knew I didn't have a, I was lucky enough to be playing college baseball. And to be honest with you, I was, I, I had a, I didn't play a whole lot just because I had a bunch of injuries. So obviously you guys were talented than me. So I had to talk with them and I told them, listen, I think it's best for me if I just stop playing, hang them up and start focusing on my career. And that's what I did. And sure enough, three weeks later, uh, I was able to, you know, start my career as a professional. But yeah, so, um, that was it, you know, uh, I played college baseball at a division two level and I played a bunch of JV games, but I can say I had a one varsity at bat and I struck out. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's, Hey, that's okay. You, you made it further than, uh, a lot of kids, uh, make it these days, you know, so you got the experience, but, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. I mean, growing up, what's it, I mean, is, is, Baseball, the most popular sport, I guess, for kids growing up in Puerto Rico. I mean, are you oh, almost yeah, forced absolutely. into it in a way? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of sports. Baseball being the biggest. Uh, I'll say there's started three. There's four main sports in Puerto Rico. Baseball being number one. Basketball being number two. Uh, boxing is three. It used to be one. You know, boxing. Yeah. Puerto Rico has a big history in boxing. And Lastly, believe it or not, volleyball. Puerto Rico is really big in volleyball, especially in private schools. I was lucky enough to go to a private school in Puerto Rico um, as a kid, and uh, man, we they take we take baseball uh, volleyball seriously. I played uh, junior high volleyball and man, not junior high, elementary level volleyball, and there were some intense games. But uh, <laughs> obviously, baseball baseball is on our blood. It's what we do. Uh, yeah, it's a life. So. And obviously, it's probably, you know, it's a tough decision to walk away from the game. And I mean, you know, you did it for a while. And, you know, it obviously provided you a great opportunity to go to a good school, uh, it seems like. And, you know, when when you got to, to Southern Nazarene, what, what did you what was your course of study for everybody that's listening so that they understand how you, yeah, how you so got to I, um, right Like I said, I wanted to go in into I want to be a broadcaster. I obviously figure, well, I speak Spanish. I don't know how many Spanish speaking college uh, students are going or studying broadcasting to be a Spanish speaking broadcaster. So I thought that was like a niche, almost a loophole for me. Mm-hmm. But as I started doing it, and obviously I enjoyed it because I got to talk baseball and sports with, you know, with my friends, uh, you know, my classmates and friends. So and then so I figured, you know what, this is not really what I want to do. I didn't, I didn't want to do it, especially just because I knew eventually if I wanted to be a Spanish broadcaster, I was going to be able to get out of experience broadcasting games in Spanish, so I then, uh, so my major was always sports communication, so that's what I studied in college. Uh, for my undergrad, eventually, right after I graduated, I went back um, to school to get my master's in sports management and administration. Gotcha. So, <clears throat> Once you once you did that, and okay, so you, I'm not going to skip past the uh, interning for the uh, the thunder. I thought that was pretty neat. So once right. you, when you said you started your professional career, is that, uh, is that when the internship started like pretty much immediately or? Correct. Yeah. So not immediately. Um, I would say obviously I, I quit playing baseball. I hung them up. Like they say, um, mm-hmm. I'll say about the following October. So let's say this was around January when I hang them up, probably September, October. Then I, uh, I started my first internship with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, and then from there, everything just, just moved on from there. Wow. Probably probably some pretty cool experiences yeah, at the internship, I'm sure. Yeah, no, it was cool. It was cool. I mean, both at, with the Thunder and the Oklahoma City Dodgers, um, I got to see a lot. I got to learn a lot. So the Thunder was a different... Uh, it was a different dynamic because we were what they call... Um, Game night interns, so we really showed up only for games and game nights. Um, most of us were still college students, so all we did was we uh, showed up to the game, ran stats to the press and media members, and then post games we transcribed uh, all the home teams or the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, quotes, and that's what we did. I mean, from time to time, if you were scheduled to, you know, to run the uh, 
frontline media table, then you had to show up a little bit earlier and you had to day before you had to go to the uh, practice facility and do some things. But that was in, it was a great experience, but obviously my internship with the Oklahoma City Dodgers was what gave me my, gave me more experience, gave me, got my feet wet with translating and being an interpreter for players. Uh, I learned a lot from that. And I, and also it was, you know, it was the first year that the Dodgers to Oklahoma City as their affiliate. So there were a lot of things going on at that time for the Oklahoma City Dodgers. Now, now and, and for most people who don't really realize, you know, obviously the minor leagues don't have the funding that the major league ball clubs do. So how, how was that like working? And, you know, there's a lot of, of, you know, Hispanic baseball players that are in the minor leagues grinding and getting after it every day. And they don't have the support that these, you know, some of these guys in the big leagues have. How, how, how unique was that situation for you? No, it was awesome. Like I said, uh, I learned a lot. I got to explain a lot of things. The first time I, uh, I was an interpreter. First time I translated for players, uh, Two of the main players was a guy that got paid a lot of money and never got anywhere. Uh, Hector Oliveira, he was a Cuban guy. Other guy, he was signed by the Dodgers and eventually traded to the Braves. And then he got a domestic violence dispute and eventually he disappeared from the game. Hmm. Um, so I chose a lot for him. Also had um, Jose Peraza, who was with the Dodgers for a while. And then they got him for... From the Braves and eventually trying to Cincinnati. So I'm like, I, I definitely got to explain a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, those guys, they're grinders. I, they, you know, a lot of people talk about minor league baseball players. I mean, big league players, sorry. But you need to, I think a lot of people, uh, underestimate minor league players. You know, they, they grind every day, uh, for almost nothing. They don't get paid anything and they go out for seven, nine months, uh, out of the year and just grind and grind for a dream to try to accomplish a dream while well, they're not getting paid anything. This, most of the push are sleeping in people's living room. It, it, it's a tough grind. Mm. So w- tell us, walk us through when you got the, uh, the call uh, about th- being the interpreter for the twins. I, I, that must've been pretty cool. Right. So yeah, so at that time uh, I had just graduated uh, from college. I had just started my master's because it was almost, January and I was like, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get a job this time around. Uh, so I must go to school, go to school, wait one, wait for this season to go by, and then try try it again because the MLB hiring period is between the end of the World Series until early January. Mm. I obviously had a lot of different interviews. I uh, I was in the running for, or I was interviewing for the Red Sox interpreting job, and um. I had already interviewed for the twins, which is a funny story. I had interviewed the twins for a communications internship, another internship, and I didn't get it, but I uh, guess I made a good impression on my, on the person I eventually became my boss, and he called me once MLB established that every single team that I had interpreter, he gave me a call and said, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't, you know, whatever, the internship didn't work out, but I have this position for you. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And that was about a, I would say, uh, Thursday, if he texted me on Thursday night saying, Hey, uh, you know, I would like to have a talk to with you. So we talked Friday morning. Um, then we had another talk with him Friday around lunchtime and around six o'clock. He calls me and said, Hey, the general manager wants to talk to you. Will you be available to Skype with him? And I was like, Sure, yeah. So I was running around wow. the house trying to find, trying to find my suits and whatnot. And so I, I talked to the then. Like I said, uh, the Twins general manager, Terry Ryan, and I talked with him, had an interview with him for about 45 minutes to an hour, and, you know, eventually they invited me out to the fan fest uh, a few weeks over. It was kind of like my, the final session of the interview, and it was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday before I left, they made an offer. So I uh, I took it. I don't think I even thought about it. I just kind of said, yes, it kind of came out of my mouth without even realizing what was <laughs> being offered or... So okay. I lost all contract uh, negotiation leverage whatsoever. I just say yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> so your your dream of be, uh, becoming uh, going to the majors it happened in one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> right, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah. Obviously, you know, to be honest with you, I know a lot of people struggle with changing them up and finding their true um, their true identity after baseball or sports in general. Uh, but I don't know. I never, I never had that. I knew it was it and that was it, but definitely felt good to be able to say, Oh, I work for a big league team. It was definitely a, yeah, that, it that, was a big thing for me. 
Yeah, that adds some so, uh, some brownie points there. For so when you got hired right after Fan Fest and all that, I guess did you travel with the team to Florida for spring training then? Right, right when their season kicked off. Right. So I came home. I came back to Oklahoma City. I had to pack everything. I had to basically move my life to Minnesota, find an apartment, send my car to Minnesota, do all these different things. While you know the team, the uh, once it's time for spring training, not everybody. You know, the team doesn't fly to here to spring training. Most of the players live in Florida anyway, so they only kind of shows up in Florida. So they pull me out to Florida, obviously, and uh, you get there, you get your, they give you a rental car, they give you a place to stay, they give you uh, meal money uh, for every single day. And, uh, yeah, so you just kind of show up, and once camp breaks at the end of spring training, then everybody goes on the same plane together, obviously. Gotcha. So... I guess this is probably the fun part that most people are probably going to want to know about in a way. And, you know, the, I'd like you to walk us through, like, what your typical day at the ballpark during the regular season would be. Like, when, you know, for a 7 o'clock game, when would Carlos show up? Uh, you know, what did you have to do prior to the game uh, to help the players out, to help yourself out, to help the media out? What what was your normal routine bef- pregame? And then walk us through all that and then, you know, post game as well. Right, so the first thing I tell you, you know, you guys and whoever is listening is that there's no normal routine in, you know, sports. Um, there's not such a thing. You don't wake up every day at 7 a.m. and you go to work at by 8 a.m. and you're up by 5 p.m. That's not how it works in sports in general, you know. Uh, for me, usually, it depends on the day. You know, obviously, I travel everywhere with the team. I was everywhere with the team. So for me, my schedule was a little flexible, but I usually try to show up to the stadium around 10 a.m. and was being part of the PR department. I had a few duties in terms of producing game notes, which is what every team produces. Uh, and it has um, team statics and information about the team, the previous game, the matchups and all that, all different types of information. Um, and then uh, we had like a lunchtime. And then from like 1.30 to 3, 4, yeah, uh, between well, I would say between two and five o'clock, then or four o'clock, you do interviews in the clubhouse. There's media availability time. Uh, clubhouse opens, media members show up. They, you know, they ask players for interviews. Uh, obviously, if a Spanish speaking player wanted my help with the interviews, I help them with that. Um, then after that, uh, they do, they go through BP, and you just kind of become more of like a downtime for for me at least, and just kind of chill out in the uh, dugout, talk to, you know, the players to come in and out. Hmm. Um, there's people, obviously, you always have those um, people that like, come and watch BP on the field. You kind of talk to them, interact with them. Um, for us, the Twins, we had two security guards at each of the dugouts, and, you know, you we made good friends with them. With them, uh, Dan and Tony, they were great. They are great guys, I mean, they're still there. Um, so, yeah, so, and then after that, BP was over. Kinda, the players came, went back to the clubhouse, they showered, they ate, whatever they needed to do to get ready for the game. If they needed you, they needed me then. Um, I mean, obviously, I was a little to them. And one thing with my position, I guess, is just different than anybody else, is that I was more than just, I was more a liaison for them, for the Spanish speaking players. I had a lot to do with, uh, you know, it almost came to where, like, I helped them with different personal stuff, uh, where sure. was opening bank yeah. accounts. Uh, Anything you know, day-to-day day life, talking, right? I mean, just in general. Correct, yeah, I mean, correct. like, you know, you know, getting a rental car and bunch. all that stuff. I mean, anything normal mm-hmm. in life, I guess, you, I'm sure they needed help with. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, I know it's one of those that everybody watches. I mean, and when, you know, as sports fans, I think me and Dan grew up, we remember Hideo Nomo came over from Japan, oh. and they spent all this money for him. And, you know, he got catered to and had his own personal translator for – they went everywhere with him. And, you know, there's these guys in, in the big leagues that are fighting like you just brought up earlier about every day in the minors, and they don't have this support system. So to, to hear what you got to do and be a part of and give these guys a little bit of support in their regular life, just not on the baseball field, but just in life in general, things that we take for granted in America, that what a, what a crazy thing to really even have to think about, honestly. I mean, it's, it's pretty yeah, neat I mean, to hear you talk about it. Lot. It's not a lot of thing that I, I think a lot of people don't think about or they, they don't pay attention to the fact that, yeah, they're young, they're adults, and, you know, they're, they're professional athletes. They have, you know, some of them have a lot of money and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the people that are not from this country, people that don't speak the language as well, 
Um, obviously, and even and even if they know the language, it's still not their their native language. So it, sometimes it can be hard. So mm-hmm. you know, having someone that can uh, help them and have there's a thin line between helping them out and kind of holding them back. But obviously, uh, you try to help them as much as possible without babying them. And, uh, and that was a big part. Of that. I took a lot of pride in that part of my job. But um, yeah, so we did that, and then it was game time. And uh, for me, I had other duties during game time with the baseball operations department. Uh, and I did those. If not, I was in the press box watching the game. And after the game is over, if we were the winning team, there was interviews on the team. If we were not, then, you know, the clubhouse opened again, at, uh, I think about 20 minutes after the game, and there was meeting availability, and that was it. And you were out of the stadium by 11.30. By the time you got home, it was about, it was almost 1 a.m. And get up the next day and do it all over again. On the road, it's different because we're not the home team. Obviously, so uh, we usually show up to the ballpark uh, between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. And with the availability, availability, it was game time. The game was over. We got out of there. We took a bus to the hotel, team hotel, and do it all over again. <laughs> Man, what a day. What a week. <laughs> right, and that's the thing. You know, you know, uh, baseball players work hard, but, you know, the supporting stuff behind the baseball players work hard as well. And, mm. you know... Well, you're at home on the road. We're talking about eighty to a hundred hours, which depend on you know, because there were games that can go you know can go so long to or like twenty innings, for mm-hmm. example. So, you know, you never know. You never know what to expect in any given day. <laughs> Too bad you didn't get overtime, huh, Carlos? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no, I did not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we the next question I was going to ask you is actually about some of the challenges um, that uh, you know Spanish-speaking players face. Um, in the major leagues, and you, you you mentioned a couple of them, um, and but I also want to dig a little bit deeper in that. Um, I had mentioned in the beginning of the episode about you know there being a thirty percent uh, Latino ratio uh, for for players um, with baseball, like kind of losing its edge with all these new and great things in technology. Kids aren't watching baseball as much anymore, and. Um, you know, different things like different sports that are out now. There's actually kickball leagues and things like that. Um, right, do you right. think? Do you do you have any fear of um people losing interest, to, or or do you think uh, for the Latino community community, or do you think baseball is always going to be that that thing that they strive for? Well, I think um I think there's a few things to mention here. I mean, I think obviously, I know baseball back in the day was America's pastime, and I think it's you know, it's 2018, and obviously baseball is not America's pastime anymore. Um, obviously, I think you know it has to be football at at this point. I think um, so. I think that that's some that's dangerous, in, not dangerous in a way, but I think it hurts the game. Obviously, the game is expanding uh, around the world, which is important. Um, and you know, there's a lot of socioeconomic things that we can talk about, and a lot of different things. Um, you know. Uh, when you say, you know, oh, well, kids don't play baseball because it's too expensive. Kids don't do this because baseball is boring. There's a lot of different things. And when you go look back at us when we were growing up, um, you know, especially, I mean, now I don't, I'm not calling you guys old, <laughs> but um, <laughs> ahead, you guys growing up watching the game through your grandparents, through your, you know, grandfather, through your dad. That's the people right. that thought you the game and uh, for me it was the same thing even though you know I'm, I'm a different generation but I think that's something that is definitely going to affect the game because we have guys now that are growing up watching football watching basketball and they don't watch baseball because they think it's boring so I think definitely that's, that that affects the game but I think what baseball is doing in terms of it's expanding its surrounding throughout the world is great I mean I think the WBC is a big it's a big uh, big key to what baseball is trying to become and Obviously, the the most popular sports in sport in the world is the World Cup. It's soccer, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah. baseball's going to get to that to that same level, and and I think they're doing a good job, especially with games in Japan. Like I said, WBC this past two days in Puerto yeah. I think it's part of it. Um, I was about but to now, say. If you ask me, if you ask me, will baseball stop being what it is in Latin American countries, especially the Caribbean, Cuba, Dominican, Puerto Rico? No, absolutely not. Puerto Rico is what we do. Puerto Rico is what we are uh, not Puerto Rico. Baseball is what we do. It's how we live. Um, you know, those Caribbean countries. All we do, all we know how to do in terms of sports, play baseball. So I don't, I don't see how that will will affect the game. Okay, I'll tell in you that way. We're like we don't have any Latin American players playing, but no, 
the one um, the one so, thing I think ahead. Carlos to jump in here and and I, America is spoiled. These kids are spoiled rotten with all the video games and all that. I'll tell you, they're the World Baseball Classic is probably one. I, I watched it. I, I didn't get into it the first time they did it, and this time Same I, here. Same I here. got into it. There's nothing more exciting than watching Team Puerto Rico play, watching the Dominican Republic play. Those guys play with so much flair and so much fun and so much excitement that it's infectious. I mean, it's like playoff baseball. Every time those guys get on the field, it's so exciting, invigorating. And I, I think it, uh, th- these kids in America better watch out because these Latin kids are playing like that, and they're gonna, just going to get railroaded and ran by if they don't pick up the pace. But it, it, I, I have to agree with what you were saying, I think, and there's no way the game's probably going to die down there in, the, in that area, just watching the, the flavor and the love that these people have playing for their country and the, how much excitement they have being teammates with each other. Yeah. Right, and, and two things to point out, too, as well, is that, first of all, in countries like Dominica and Cuba, Baseball is a way to get out of your life and be able to construct a life for yourself. You know, we're talking about countries that, or people in countries that don't have a whole lot of things other than, you know, maybe one pair of shoes and you know, some of these kids even walk uh, barefooted to to school. So mm-hmm. when in the Dominican in, in the Dominican and Cuba, it comes to a point where you about to hit that junior high age, eighth grade, seventh grade, where as a kid, you have to decide, well, do I want to go to school or do I want to play baseball? And obviously, they, baseball is the way to go. It's where the money's at. So I think that's a big thing. It's a style of life for them. And I think that you pointed out is the fact, you know, the flair of Latin American players. And I think that's a big thing that there's so many unwritten rules in baseball where well, you can't pimp a home run, bat flips, this and that. And and I think if you look at other sports like basketball, you have LeBron James dunking or somebody going all crazy and screaming all over the court. Well, why is it okay for LeBron James to do it but not for Joey Bats to throw his bat in the middle of the playoffs <laughs> against the Rangers, you know? <laughs> it's part of the game. If you're to, if we're, it's a whole different generation. We don't have, you know, Kyle Ripken Jr. playing baseball anymore. You know, he'll hit a home run and tuck his head down and run. You know, this is... The Carlos Correa, Francisco Lindor, the Bryce Hypers of the world, you know, the people have passion and they don't care if people see them. So I think, I think there's a thin line between that and I think baseball could be affected if they don't, if the players themselves don't start accepting that, you know, a batter's not trying to show you up, a better seat, they're just playing with their emotion. And I think it's, it's another topic we can talk about. It's kind of hypocritical it, it, because it, when pitchers strike, they strike somebody out and they scream and they get all hyped. Well, you're kind of showing up the batter. So why can you do that and a batter cannot? you know, watch a ball fly. So it, I think that eventually, if, if we don't start embracing it, I think it will affect the game eventually. I, I swear we should just have a, a, a new podcast called The Unwritten Rules of Baseball where we just sit and we right. just bitch about it because every single episode we have, <laughs> we have someone has brought that up. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's, it's true, though. I, I agree with you, uh, Carlos. I, I if, and, and I think this is probably something that gets forgotten is if you go down the road that some of these guys have done to get to where they are, it's no damn wonder they're so excited when they hit a home run or something spectacular. It, there's no wonder when you, you talk about kids running barefoot to school. I mean, it, it's no wonder that they get that excited when they do something that's so impressive. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if people can't understand that, then shame on them. That's, that's, that's your problem, right. not, not theirs. I mean, honestly. I think so too. And I mean, it's a kid's game. It, you know, it, that's all that it is. So don't get upset when a, an adult inner kid comes out after, you know, they do something great on the game. I, I, I think it's a thin line, and I think, you know, baseball sometimes, not baseball itself, but the players themselves sometimes don't, don't think radically. I mean, like, yes, for example, this past two games in Puerto Rico, Lindor hit the home big home run, and he apologized to the media for what he did just in case, you know, the Twins... <laughs> just in case the Minnesota Twins had a problem with the way he celebrated, and you know, and I think it's kind of ridiculous that it comes to that point where Francisco and North feels like he needs to apologize for just playing with emotion. Political correctness is should not enter the Latin world. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So I mean, you look at WB, you look at WBC. You know, Carlos Correa hit a home run, and and the whole team was by home play like if it was a walk off. You have Javi Baez celebrating a tie at second base before the ball got in. To his glove. That, that's just that how was awesome. The game. I want that for a poster, honestly. Like, I want to get a picture of him <laughs> with his hand up like that before he catches the ball because I, I just, that, right. that, so, I yeah, love so that. I think it's just two different types of baseball that they play here in the United States and how they play down in the Caribbean and Latin America. 
So, so you brought this up and, and this is something I honestly interviewing you at this point and, and what we're doing couldn't have been any better. And honestly, I, in my heart, I feel like it was perfect timing to, to, to bring you on and get to speak to you. Um, you know, it's been since 2010, um, and everything that Puerto Rico has been through with, uh, the hurricane hitting the Island and all that those people have been through. Um, how much of, of that do you think that means to, to the people, to the players and, I mean, there's got to be a piece of you that's missing missing being there with that, huh? Obviously, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, Puerto Ricans are so proud. We are so proud of who we are, where we come from. You know, it's funny because if you meet a Puerto Rican, they have a Puerto Rican flag somewhere in their house, somewhere in the car, somewhere in their clothing. You know, we're, we're proud of who we are and where we come from, and we're very proud of that flag. Uh, and, and I know, you know, it's kind of the misconception that people get. Yeah, we are American citizens, and we're part of the United States, but... Puerto Ricans are very proud of being who we are, being Puerto Rican, and we will always be Puerto Ricans before we're Americans. And I think that that speaks volumes to who we are as people. We we take pride on our life, on our island, how beautiful it is. And obviously, the hurricanes, the past two hurricanes that went through the island, which were the first two in almost I don't know ten years, it, it hurts. It hurts the island. You never want to see the island the way it is. And obviously, I think it's also what. It's more sad as the fact that this destruction of the hurricanes had in Puerto Rico uh, kind of unravel a lot of different things about government and you know, so, like the power rate in Puerto Rico was terrible. Just yesterday before the game, the power, the whole island was without power again. So I think it, it, hmm. it's, it's it's a bad it's a bad strategy, uh, but I think um, this past games and the game of baseball itself, I think it's lifting the island. Oh, for sure. You can you can hear it. <laughs> you can feel it. Yeah, when they when they threw out the first pitch and and for what's his name uh, the twins of Barrios or what, to get it to get the start. I mean, yeah. that that's that's got to be you know for him just mind blowing and it got to be crazy feeling the electric the electricity had to be flying through his body. I can't imagine. Mm. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You know, and last year when we were talking, when I was talking to Barrios and Rosario about this and Vargas, who's now in Triple A, but. The thing that's so big for them, or what's so big for them, is that they've played in that stadium before. They've played in front of those people before. they with the Puerto Rican jersey on. So it's different meaning for them to be able to play their, with their team, you know, their, with their, mm-hmm. with a professional team jersey, which is a whole different, it's a whole different thing, you know. So, so I think that was, that's what was so big for them because they've seen their team play against other countries, but they've never seen their own players. I'm not never, but this current generation, they haven't seen this current generation play professionally against another professional team. And I think that's what made it so big. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I, I, I gotta know. So I, I know you're no longer, you're no longer with the twins organization. Um, what are your plans going forward? Does it involve baseball? Does it involve broadcasting? Uh, broadcasting? You know, <laughs> you see, <laughs> spend this past few years with the twins to see how the twins do. It's great. Um, you know, it's. I want to say I don't want to say it's a dream I never had because I always wonder what it would be like to travel with a professional team and with a, be with a professional team. So it was definitely something you know a great dream that I've accomplished. Um, I think I tell people that ask me, well, why would you leave? And I said, well, the Yankees beat us so the Yankees walk out loss was so bad for us that I had to quit. I had to walk away from baseball. <laughs> but uh, now the reality is, you know. Um, I think I fulfilled everything I wanted to out of the position, and I think um, obviously it wasn't it was the type of decision that it wasn't to be what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's kind of hard to be an interpreter 24-7 through nine months of the year, trying to build a life and a family. Right. So, um, so I think it was time. It was time. I think I fulfilled everything I needed to. I, 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 didn't, need, I didn't see what else I could have accomplished other than winning a World Series with the team, obviously, but... Um, but it was time to move on, and I uh, obviously I, I got my master's in sports management while working for the Twins, and um, it, it was funny. It was different from what I studied, which was communications, and I wanted to pursue that a little bit better. And with working with players and meeting different agents and knowing the dynamics of baseball operations and general managers and all that, um, I, I decided that well, you know what? Maybe I want to work in administration in the baseball side. And I've always the kid always wanted to go to law school, so. Right now, I'm pursuing law school in the hopes of maybe, I'm not saying exactly what I would like to do, whether it's be a general counsel for a sports franchise or any company out there, or even be a sports agent. Um, mm. I think a lot of players, 
uh, especially Spanish speaking employees, obviously, are represented by their agents, but most of these agents are not lawyers. And you don't have to be a lawyer to be an agent in the MLB, but I think it helps and yeah, I think definitely. it gives you more credibility. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, some of these guys that work in the business yeah. are, you know, Joe from the street who, hey, I'll be an agent and they took the test and passed another agent. And so, how, right. how much do these um, Spanish guys kind of get taken advantage of a little bit by some of those people? Right, I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure you ran into some of that with some of these guys, right? I mean, the hardships that they fought. Obviously, yeah, you know, not to mention the names, but, you know, there's, there's, yeah. there's players especially on the big, on the Twins Clubhouse, for example, uh, who just have you know, a bunch of friends and, you know, oh, yeah, this is my friend so-and-so. I met him in New York one time, and now he's handling my money. You know, that makes no sense. You know, what are, what are you talking about? Um, and, you know, the guy might work at McDonald's, and he's handling your money. How does that work? So, yeah, so there's definitely uh, just a gray, again, only gray area between agents and people that are good friends of the players who help them in different aspects. So I think that helps. And also, you know, you look, you go down to Dominican and all these, they call them Buscones, which is like they're guys that run academies and they take the player in and they help them train to get signed in the big leagues. But what they don't tell you is that these guys, what they do is once that player signs, they take 50% of the bonus, signing bonus. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, wow. So yeah, so there's, there's different, they take, they get taken advantage a lot, especially when the kids are just one. Like I said, I'm. Oh, so the Braves just got, the Braves just got busted for that big time, right? I mean, taking advantage of the, of the players. I mean, and wasn't the Red Sox too maybe involved in a little bit of that or something? Well, I think I think the Bra- I'm not exactly sure what they did. Um, I know that they were following some of the MLB rules just because there's yeah. such a great line in this. So, but yeah, no, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of uh, things that are not. You know, are, they're not like they are in the, in the United States. You know, for example, Yasiel Puy got smuggled out of Cuba by a Mexican cartel. And next thing you know, the Mexican cartel is showing up at the Dodgers hotel looking for him for their money. So Jeez. it's a whole different world down there. Yeah. Wow. wow. Oh, my goodness. Unbelievable. Wow. Oh, well, Carlos, this this has been awesome. I'm so glad you could come on. Um, uh, we're going to get you off here in just a couple seconds here, but we have to ask a question. Uh, we ask this question to every one of our guests that comes on. Um, I didn't, I didn't give you much time. Uh, I'm not going to give you much time to think about it. So I apologize. So you got to think on your toes here. All right. So the question we ask all of our guests is if you had one at bat in the major leagues, what would your walkout song to the plate be? Oh, wow. Um, well, hopefully I don't strike out like I did in college, but, um, um, that's a tough, uh, probably something, probably two options if they're, Silence by Marshmallow, Fit Khaled, or maybe anything by Bad Bunny, who is a Spanish trap artist. He has good stuff. Sometimes it's not very appropriate, but yeah, he, yeah. He, he can rap a little bit. So probably like, either Silence by Marshmallow and Khalid or anything by Bad Bunny. All right. That, I don't think we'll ever get uh, those those two requests, requests for, anybody for anybody else. That's, that's pretty cool, man. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you coming on. I I enjoyed the interview. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone listening um, enjoyed it as well. And uh, we we wish you luck, my friend, and uh, keep us updated. For real, real. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, It's been a pleasure. And uh, uh, I like this. I like it. So if you want to call me every other week, I'm open for it. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, man. I told Dan the other day, I was like, maybe maybe Carlos could reach out to one of the players and we do something really unique and he can translate for us. Like, how how crazy would that be? I'm sure we can work something out. <laughs> oh, that'd be a lot of fun. Well, that would I'm be okay interesting. with that. Hey, I, I tell you, I, I just sitting here preparing to talk to you and, and just thinking about and hearing the stories you were telling, I just it paints a great picture. And, you know, it's growing up as an American here and, and, and you know, my whole life, obviously. I mean, I've went on vacation to the islands and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I respect and appreciate the, the thing that you're doing for some of these people that need so much support and help that, you know, we spend all our money to go to – to a big league game and we think these guys have everything, but you kind of forget a little bit about the, the regular things behind the scenes in life and everything that they go through. And, you know, I think it's pretty, pretty cool perspective that you could give me and Dan and even our listeners and everybody out there. So thank you very, very much. I, I really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you, to you again down the road. You're welcome. One more thing, just based on what you just said, I think a lot of people need to realize that, yeah, you're going to go watch a guy that's making $25 million a year, but at the end of the day, when the guy takes a uniform off, he's a regular, normal person who pays with taxes, 
and has a family, you know. And mm-hmm. while they have a lot of money, they're still a normal person. So uh, I think that's what I, I, I think that people need to also realize when it comes to sports. Yeah, they're superstars, but at the end of the day, they're just normal people. It's good to know. It's awesome. It's All good right. to hear. Thank you, Carlos. Really, really appreciate it, man. You you take care of yourself. Best of luck in the future, and 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 hope all goes well with every, whatever career you choose to get into from here. Thank you. Good luck with this podcast, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. See ya. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as we enjoyed having the interview. It was a good one. It was a lot of fun. I I definitely enjoy his perspective and and his thoughts and ideas and the things he did. And and I wish him the best of luck moving forward. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we're going to end the show here, guys. Um, As always, check us out on all of our social media. We're on everything now i i I can there's probably maybe one thing we're not on but we got tumblr we got youtube we got pinterest uh facebook instagram you can find us on there at uh going yard podcast and also also on twitter at going yard and the number two damn you twitter for not allowing going yard podcast as a full thing we were like just short of it at going Yard podcast for that but yeah check us out on all those if you can Check out our Podbean webpage. Uh, we have all kinds of stuff on there. We're posting videos, pictures, as we do them, as we take them. Um, I've been working. We got uh, new stickers that I, I posted on our Facebook page about being for sale. Uh, if you go on our Podbean webpage, you can find it underneath the, uh, the merchandise tag uh, on there. You know, just go right through your PayPal, use your credit card, uh, and we'll get them right out to you. We appreciate the support, the love. We can't thank you enough. It's uh, Every week's a, a new... New topics we we feel and we work really hard at it. I put a lot of work in I, in between shows trying to get the web page updated and the links put in so that you can go and find us on all these places. And you know it's it's a little bit of work, but it's a lot of excitement when when you guys are giving us feedback and you're we're getting likes and subscribes and all that stuff. So we 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 look forward to hearing what you guys think of this episode and continuing to give you more and more each week. All right. So for Carlos Font, I'm Dan. And I'm Tyler. See ya. Later.